Welcome to part 2 of the video about the hidden math behind surface roughness measurement and calculation. Make sure to watch part 1 first, as it explains the basis of what's being discussed here, such as the general definitions of surface roughness and the specific case we're investigating here. Are you coming straight from part 1? Perfect. Now we can go on. Written on many engineering handbooks, or taught at college level courses, are the mysterious Schmalz formulae. You may often find the name Schmalz spelled in a different way, and that is another hint about the mystery surrounding those formulae. The Schmalz formulae are meant to provide a good approximation of the surface roughness parameters in case of a machine surface. The first formula is the one for the maximum roughness R max, or RT, and says it is approximately equal to the feed rate squared over 8 times the radius. It is usually expressed with an extra factor of 1000, since the roughness parameters are usually expressed in micrometers, whereas the feed rate and radius are usually expressed in millimeters. The second Schmalz formula gives an approximation for the average roughness R A, as 1 over 32, times the feed rate squared over the radius. Again, this usually comes with an extra factor of 1000 for compensating the different units of measurement. But there is another version of that second formula, where we have instead 0.032, instead of 1 over 32. Once again, here is the most used version, with the extra factor of 1000 for compensating the different units of measurement. It's a bit confusing to have two different formulae for the average roughness, isn't it? It's fair to say that 32 is ambiguous. 1 over 32 is exactly 0.03125, which is closer to 0.031 than to the 0.032 of the second formula. I guess one of them provides the more accurate, correct approximation, and I guess those who came up with the other one just messed things up somehow. And I found both versions of the formula for R A in university-level didactic material, as well as in technical handbooks or scientific papers. There's definitely some confusion about those formulae, and I'm pretty sure very few have knowledge of the derivation of these formulae, other than Mr. Schmalz himself. Apparently, not even many university professors. So, where do the Schmalz formulae come from? Is there just a numerical approximation approach behind those formulae? Or is there a deeper mathematical meaning? Which formula for the average roughness is correct and why? Is it the first one, or the second one? The truth is we don't know. At least I don't know, since I couldn't find any explanations anywhere. And who is Mr. Schmalz by the way? This video is basically my own unconditioned attempt at finding out the answers to those questions, relying just on my own investigation, as I couldn't find any source material. So, let's go back to our machine surface, with the radius R and the feed rate F explicitly indicated. What's the maximum roughness R max, or RT, as we will call it for the rest of our video? It's defined as the difference in height between the highest peak and the lowest valley, and it seems a pretty straightforward calculation in our idealized geometric profile. Well, if we look at the grooves on the surface, they repeat periodically. That means we can focus on only one of them. Let's now draw a second radius like this, down to the bottom of the valley on the surface profile. Let's also draw a line going from peak to peak, and let's consider this yellow triangle here. The vertical side of the triangle is simply the radius R minus the maximum roughness RT. The horizontal side of the triangle is half the feed rate F. Let's just focus on this triangle by removing it from its context and let's apply Pythagoras theorem. The vertical side R minus RT is equal to the square root of the hypotenuse squared, which is R squared, minus the horizontal side squared, which is F over 2 squared. If we bring the radius R from the left side to the right side and we switch signs, we easily get the formula for the maximum roughness RT. As you can see, that was pretty straightforward. But how about Schmalz formula? It's pretty different from the one we got. The reason is that the Schmalz formula is an approximation, but how can it be derived from the actual exact formula? Let's now look at the form of the two formulae. If we consider the radius R as a fixed parameter, that is a constant term, and the feed rate F as a variable, we'll see that the Schmalz formula is expressed in a polynomial form. On the other hand, the exact formula is a non-polynomial function, since there's a square root. And we know polynomials only allow addition, subtraction, multiplication and integer powers. The variable F cannot be at the denominator, nor under a square root, etc. So, what's the best polynomial approximation of a non-polynomial function? We know it is the Taylor expansion of that function. In other words, the truncated Taylor series. So, let's calculate the Taylor expansion of our formula, and let's keep the Schmalz formula right there at the top as a reminder. For those of you who do not know anything about Taylor series, I will show a step-by-step -step explanation here, for this specific case. However, I'm assuming you have a basic knowledge of calculus and you know how to differentiate a function, and what that means. Let's start by writing the generic form of a polynomial. 
Our variable here is the feed rate f. This, in general, will have a constant term, which we will call a 0. Then, a term proportional to the variable f, with a coefficient that we will call a 1. Then again, a term proportional to the square of the variable f, with a coefficient a 2. Another term proportional to the cube of the variable f, with a coefficient a 3, and so on. We want to find the polynomial that best approximates our original function. For this purpose, we first have to choose the center of the Taylor expansion, that is the point close to which we want to have the best possible approximation. Since a low roughness value is often desired, we will choose f equals zero as the center of the Taylor expansion. This means that our polynomial will be a better approximation of the original function the more the feed rate is close to zero. Also, generally, choosing zero as the center of a Taylor expansion is a pretty common choice. Now, if we want the polynomial to be the best possible approximation of the exact formula, at least around f equals zero, our first requirement is that both the polynomial and the original function are the same when calculated in f equals zero. Pretty simple concept, isn't it? So, let's see what's the output value of the original formula for f equals zero. As you can see, the second term inside the square root vanishes to zero, and we are eventually left with r minus r, which is zero. Pause the video and take your time to follow all the steps if you wish, especially for the calculations further on, which will become much more articulate. So, for f equals zero, rt is equal to zero. Let's keep this result there as a reminder. What about our polynomial? You can see that, when f equals zero, all the terms with the variable f, whatever power of f it is, vanish to zero, so that we're left with the constant term a, zero only. We are now ready to apply our first requirement, by equaling the two results we got. What we end up with, is that a, zero has to be equal to zero. Our polynomial will have a zero constant term, which is like, no constant term at all. In other words, if we were to consider the best constant approximation of RT, at least near f equals zero, that would be the function equal to zero everywhere. But that isn't a reasonable approximation, so let's move ahead and find out more. So, we now consider a second requirement. We now want the rate of change of our polynomial to be the same as the rate of change of the original exact function, for f equals zero, which is the center of our Taylor expansion. In other words, if we are talking about the graphs of these functions, the slope of the polynomial and the slope of the original function must be equal for f equals zero. The rate of change and the slope of a function translate into the derivative of that function. The second requirement is then that the derivative of the polynomial and the derivative of the original exact function must be equal for f equals zero. So, let's first differentiate the original function. That radius r in red is a constant and does not contribute to the derivative. The square root of something is the power of that something to the one-half exponent. Following the power rule of differentiation, we bring down that one-half exponent and it becomes a multiplying coefficient. The minus sign simply comes from the same one before the square root. Always because of the power rule, the square root, which is a power with exponent one-half, becomes a power with exponent one-half minus one, which is minus one-half. In other words, one over the square root. Then we have to differentiate the expression inside the square root r squared is a constant and gives no contribution. Let's bring out the minus one fourth coefficient and, finally, the derivative of f squared is 2f. We simplify the two and the minus sign, and we get this expression here. It's easy to see that this function, which is the derivative of the original function, is equal to zero for f equals zero, because of that f at the numerator. Now let's differentiate the polynomial. The constant term a zero does not give any contribution. The second term gets rid of the variable f, and what's left is just a 1. The third term, because of the power rule, becomes 2 a 2, times f, and so on. Again, when f equals 0, all the terms containing an f, whatever the power, will be 0. This means that the derivative of the polynomial is equal to a 1 when f equals 0. We are ready to apply our second requirement, according to which, the two results we got must be equal. This means that a 1 has to be equal to 0. Our polynomial will have a both a zero constant term and a zero first degree term. In other words, if we were to consider the best first degree approximation of RT, at least near f equals zero, that would still be the function equal to zero everywhere. But that still isn't a reasonable approximation. Now you know how we will go on with the third requirement. We require the second derivative of the polynomial to be equal to the second derivative of the original exact function, always for f equals zero. The second derivative gives us information about the concavity of the graphs of those functions, as well as how fast the slope itself changes. And we want these characteristics to be the same for both the original exact function and for the polynomial, since we want the latter to be the best possible approximation of the former. So, let's calculate the second derivative of the original exact function. 
this is simply done by differentiating the function twice, that is the same as differentiating its derivative once. And we already know its derivative from the previous step. Now I'm not going to apply the quotient rule, but the product rule, by considering the first function as the one at the numerator, which is f, and the second one as the one at the denominator, which is the square root. First, let me bring out that one fourth coefficient. Then, by the product rule, let's multiply the derivative of the first function, which is simply one, by the second function as it is. Let's then add the product between the first function and the derivative of the second function. I'm not showing the result of this second term, because we will not need it, as you will see very soon. Now we have to calculate this second derivative for f equals zero. It's easy to see that the second term inside the parenthesis will be zero, whereas this time we get a non-zero contribution from the first term. Follow the simple steps on screen to find out that the result is 1 over 4 times r. Finally, a non-zero result. Now let's calculate the second derivative of the polynomial. We can take the first derivative, which we calculated before, and differentiate it again. You see, the constant term a1 does not contribute. Then we are left with 2 times a2, and so on, always following the power rule. Once again, when f equals 0, all the terms containing an f, whatever the power, will be 0. This means that the derivative of the polynomial is equal to 2 times a2 when f equals 0. You're feeling this step will be a useful one, don't you? By applying the third requirement, we get that 2 times a2 has to be equal to 1 over 4 times r. a2 is then equal to 1 over 8 times r. The first non-zero term of our polynomial will be 1 over 8 times r. And we can stop here, since we finally found some non-trivial Taylor expansion. Our polynomial, f squared over 8 times r, is the best quadratic approximation of the original exact function. Behold. This is exactly the Schmalz formula. The Schmalz formula is the first non-zero term of the Taylor series of the exact formula for RT. But, how accurate is this approximation? Let's plot the graphs of the original exact formula and the Schmalz formula. For this graph, I'm using r equals 0.4, which is a pretty typical value for the nose radius of the cutting inserts available on the market. Please note that the feed rate f must be smaller than 2 times the radius r, which in this case means the feed rate cannot be greater than 0.8. I'll let you find out why. As you can see, up to f equals 0.4 mm per revolution, the two functions are pretty much the same, but then they diverge. However, the feed rate f is not only smaller than 2 times the radius r, but also, in practice, much smaller than that. A typical value for obtaining a well-finished surface is 0.05 mm per revolution, which sits right here on the f axis. And, if we zoom in that part, we see that the two functions overlap perfectly for small values of the feed rate f. I needed to make the graph of the Schmalz formula thicker in order to differentiate it from the graph of the original exact formula. So, we're done with the maximum roughness parameter RT. Now, let's move on to the more interesting and more complicated part because, for what follows, I couldn't find any proof anywhere or any calculations at all. This is the real heart of the video. We want to find out a formula for the average roughness parameter RA. We want to find out where this second Schmalz formula comes from. We know the general definition of the average roughness RA. First we have to find the average line of the profile, and then the average of the absolute value of all deviations of the profile from that average line. But how do we find a solution to our specific case of a machine surface? Again, let's just focus on one single groove. Let's consider the lowest point of the profile as a height of zero. How do we find the average height mu of the profile? The plan is the following. Mu is equal to the yellow area there, divided by its base, which is f. That is true since we are again using the geometric interpretation of the arithmetic mean integral formula. To find the average value of a function is the same as to find the height of a rectangle which has the same area and same base. So, how do we find the yellow area in the first place? The plan is to calculate the area of that blue circular sector, and subtract from it the area of the green triangle there, so that we'll be left with that purple circular segment. We subtract that from the area of the pink rectangle here, and we will get the yellow area. Let's write down these operations as a reminder. First of all, let's calculate the area of the pink rectangle. It's simply equal to the base, which is f, times the height, which is rt, the maximum roughness parameter we found out before, and corresponds to that expression there. Let's just multiply by f, and this is the result. Let's underline the rectangle area in our formula, so that we know how we are proceeding. Now it's time to find the area of the circular sector. For this purpose, let's draw that center radius, and let's call each of those two angles alpha. And let's consider that segment there, which is a half of f. 
Now that we delineated a square triangle, the sine of alpha is equal to the side opposite to the angle alpha, which is a half of f divided by the hypotenuse, which is the radius r. So, alpha is the arc sine, or the sine inverse if you prefer, of f over 2 times r. Now, here's a simple proportion. The area of the circular sector, over the area of the full circle, is equal to the angle 2 alpha, over a full turn angle, which is 2 pi. We simplify the two and we get to this next step, where pi r squared is the area of the full circle. We simplify pi, and we are left with alpha times r squared. But we know how to express alpha in terms of the feed rate f and the radius r, so let's get to this final result here. Another preliminary result is achieved. Now, what about the area of the green triangle there? It's equal to the base, which is f, times height, which is the radius r, minus the maximum roughness rt, all divided by 2. We know the exact formula for RT, so let's substitute it into our expression. OK, with both the area of the circular sector and the area of the triangle, we are ready to calculate the area of the circular segment, as the difference of the previous two. And here's the result. Last step. The yellow area is equal to the area of the rectangle, minus the area of the circular segment. If we carry out some basic calculation, here is the final result. The term F times R, simply comes from that multiplication above. This other term is unchanged, as you can see. This last term is the combination of the two contributions highlighted in the expression above. We are now ready to find out the average height of the surface profile as the yellow area divided by the feed rate f. Again, that's because of the geometric interpretation of the arithmetic mean value as the height of a rectangle that has the same area under the surface profile, the yellow area, and the same kind of base, which is f. It's easy to see that, if we divide each term of the expression for the yellow area by f, we end up with this result here. Take your time to figure it out. This is the average height of the surface profile, which defines the average line of the profile itself. Let's keep this result up there as a reminder. Now, let's consider all the possible deviations epsilon of the surface profile from the average line. Like this one, or this one, or this other ones. The average roughness RA, which is our ultimate goal, is defined as the arithmetic mean of the absolute value of all the possible deviations epsilon. Again, we will be using the same trick, which is to find the average value as an area divided by its kind of base. This time, the area we have to consider is this new yellow area here, which is a combination of the area which, let's say, corresponds to the positive deviations, and the one which corresponds to the negative deviations. So, the average roughness RA is equal to that composite yellow area, divided again by the feed rate F. Please note that the bottom portion of the yellow area has to be considered positive, thanks to the fact that we need to consider the absolute value of the deviations. This means that the two portions of the yellow area have indeed to be added as a single area, and we do not have to subtract the bottom portion from the upper two little horns there. Well, let's call that composite area a epsilon, since it's related to the deviations epsilon. And let's call its two portions a epsilon arrow up, those little horns, and a epsilon arrow down, that little circular segment there. The total composite area a epsilon will be the sum of those two contributions. As said, we will be using the same trick, which is to find the average value as an area divided by its kind of base, which is interpreted as the height of a rectangle with same area and base length. To find the area a epsilon, the plan is the following. We calculate the area of this circular sector. We subtract the area of this triangle, so that we will be left with the area a epsilon arrow down. Then we calculate the area of this rectangle here. We subtract the area a epsilon arrow down, so that we're left with that concave area. We add the concave area to the area of those two little rectangles. Finally, we subtract this area from the big white area there, which we calculated before and used to find the average height mu, and we'll be left with the area a epsilon arrow up. And we're done. So, let's start according to our plan. Let's draw those two radii connecting the intersection between the surface profile and the average line. Let's call each of those two angles beta and let's call that length lambda, where the average line meets the surface profile. Now we'll be using Pythagoras' theorem to find an expression for the length lambda. r minus mu, which is this segment here, is equal to the square root of r squared, which is the hypotenuse squared, minus that segment there, which is a half of lambda, squared. Let's carry out some easy calculations, and we get this formula, from which we want to find out the value of lambda. To do so, let's square both the left side and the right side of the expression. Let's expand the square of the left side. We get rid of that r squared, which is present on both sides. We're left with this. We multiply the whole equation by 4. Square root on both sides, and we're done. This is the expression for lambda. Let's keep it up there, together with the expression for mu. 
Now, let's focus again on that square triangle, whose base is a half of lambda. The sine of angle beta, is equal to the side opposite to the angle itself, which is lambda over 2, divided by the hypotenuse, which is r. By the way, you see, this is a sort of reiteration of what we did before in order to find out the average height mu. Let's write the expression like this, and beta will be the arc sine, or the sine inverse, of lambda over 2r. Now we're ready to calculate the area of that circular sector, which is identified with an additional apex beta, in order to differentiate it from the previous calculations we did with the angle alpha. I apologize, since I'm not being consistent with the colors I used during the explanation of the plan. But I hope it won't generate any confusion. Again, a simple proportion will lead us to the result. The area of the circular sector, over the area of the full circle, is equal to the angle 2 beta, over a full turn angle, which is 2 pi. The rest comes automatically. Just carry out the calculations. Now, the area of this triangle is simply base, which is lambda, times height, which is r minus mu, all divided by 2. Hence, the area a epsilon arrow down is the difference between the two areas we just calculated. Here we are. What about the area a epsilon arrow up? We'll be there in a few steps, stay with me. The area of the pink rectangle there, is equal to base, which is lambda, times height, which is mu. The combined area of those two little equal rectangles, is the sum of their bases, which is f minus lambda, stop and figure it out if you need to, times height, which is again mu. So, what we want to do is this. Take this white area. Subtract the two little rectangles. Subtract the concave area, which is in turn calculated as the area of that green rectangle minus the area of that circular segment. And we get the desired area. Now let's put some names to the various areas, and let's write down an actual expression. Let's now switch signs inside the parenthesis, because of that minus sign, before the parenthesis. Let's write down all the expressions we got from the last few minutes. Here is this. Minus this. Minus this other one. Plus this one. Feel free to go back and check out that we have already calculated all those contributions. Let's now take a look at the first row, and compare it to the expression for mu up there. Take your time to see that it's just mu, multiplied by f. Now, let's expand the second row there, by carrying out two easy multiplications. Here's the result. Now, mu times f, cancels out with the first row, and lambda times mu cancels out with the first term of the third row. Finally, we're left just with this expression. That's our area, a, epsilon arrow up. As a final step, let's find out the whole area, a, epsilon, as the sum of, a, epsilon arrow down, plus, a, epsilon arrow up. Here is the expression for the area, a, epsilon down, and here's the expression for the area, a, epsilon up. By the way, these two contributions are equal. And that's not a coincidence, since the two areas are split by the average line of the surface profile. I let you figure out why that happens. Okay, let's add up those two contributions, and we get the expression for the whole yellow area, a, epsilon. Remember, the average roughness r, a, is the arithmetic mean of the absolute values of all the deviations of the surface profile from the average line. And it is to be calculated as the area, a, epsilon divided by f. So, here is the result. Take your time to check it out. This is the average roughness of a machine surface. This is what we get from the general definition of the average roughness when we apply it to the case of a machine surface, according to our initial conditions and assumptions. But see, this formula is also expressed in terms of lambda, which in turn is a function of the radius r and the average profile height mu, and in terms of mu itself, which in turn is a function of the radius r and of the feed rate f. What's the full expansion of this formula? If we want to have it expressed in terms of our basic parameters only, the radius r and the feed rate f. If we substitute the expressions for lambda and mu inside the formula, after a couple of simplifications, we will get this monster of an expression here. Check it out yourself if you are in the mood. This is the exact theoretical formula for the average roughness. And it's cool, I had never come across the exact formula before. It's simply nowhere to be found. At least I couldn't find it anywhere. Let me know if you did. But you see, that's not the most practical formula to work with. What do we do then? As we did before with the maximum roughness RT, the plan is to find a good polynomial approximation for this formula. Well, not just a good approximation, but the best one. Should we find its Taylor expansion then? And what about the Schmalz formula? This is just one single question in disguise. And what we're about to do, is to find a Taylor expansion for this formula. That means to find out the polynomial that gives the best possible approximation for R, A. Again, we are considering R, A, and the polynomial as functions of the feed rate F only, while the radius R, is taken as a fixed parameter, in other words, a constant. 
It's the very same procedure we followed when calculating the maximum roughness RT, but this time our original exact function is a much more complicated one. Here it is. Now, we could find the Taylor expansion the hard way, which means requiring the polynomial to be equal to the original exact formula for f equals zero, since we're choosing f equals zero as the center of the Taylor expansion once again. This would help us finding the constant term of the polynomial. Then we would require the two derivatives to be equal for f equals zero, so that we get the first degree coefficient of the polynomial. And again, we may need the second derivative to be equal, to find out the second degree coefficient of the polynomial. Ideally we could go on, if we needed better approximations. But look at the original exact function. It's pretty complicated as it is. The first derivative would be even more complicated. Not to mention the second derivative. It can be done, but it requires a lot of patience and attention. Also, this time the calculations for f equals zero are not trivial. The reason is that we find f at the denominator, in more than one case. We will have to consider the limit for f approaches zero, which may not be immediate to get around to. So, the hard way is really time consuming and not so easy to carry out. In any case, that's how I first went on with the calculations. I got the result right, but the whole procedure was pretty mind melting. It was simply atrocious to stay focused. And that was the way I intended to show the calculations, but fortunately I came up with a different strategy while putting together this video. What about an easier way then? Is there one? Yes. We will not calculate the Taylor expansion of the full expression, but we will approximate the sub-functions inside the whole expression with their own Taylor expansions. For example, take a look at that arc sine function there, which repeats three times identically. And that square root, again three times the same. We will calculate the Taylor expansions of those sub-functions first. In other words, we will reduce them to a suitable polynomial form. By doing so, we will automatically get those more extended sub-functions as polynomials and so on, in a reverse cascading fashion, so to speak. This way we will not need to calculate further derivatives, but we will get the direct polynomial form for R A. Sounds like a good plan. Okay, let's start then. As the first sub-function, let's consider that arc sine function there. The first term of the Taylor expansion of the arc sine of x is equal to x, that's already a good approximation when x is close to zero. By the way, I'm not showing the steps about how to derive these expansions. The method is the same we applied when we found out the maximum roughness RT earlier on. The second term is x cubed over 6. This is an even better approximation, which works well also with x values reasonably farther away from 0. We'll stop at this second term. If we added more terms, the approximation would be each time better. And what's good is that it also works for functions of x. We just need to replace the variable x with its function f of x. In our case, where we have the arc sine of f over 2r, the Taylor expansion is simply this one. As always, take your time to check it out yourselves. Please note that we're fine if we stop at the third degree of this approximation. I mean, we need terms up to f cubed only. We'll see later why. So, we can replace the arc sine function here with its Taylor expansion. In other words, with its best polynomial approximation. Please note that, as soon as I did this, I changed the equal sign to the approximately equal sign here. Now let's take a look at that square root. Its Taylor expansion is that one. Again, I'm not showing all the calculations. However, we could get that result from something we calculated earlier. Remember the first Schmal's formula for the maximum roughness RT. If we rearrange that formula, we get exactly what we need. Just follow those easy steps on screen. Nice, isn't it? Now we replace the square root with its Taylor expansion and here is what we end up with. Another non-polynomial function reduced to its best polynomial approximation. Now, what about those two big square roots in blue? In order to go on with the calculations, let's first decide how many terms of the previous Taylor expansions we will keep. Are we free to choose? No, we aren't. However, let's pretend we can discard the higher degree terms and let's see what happens. If we carry out the calculations with the first terms of the Taylor expansions only, here is the result we get. 0. It doesn't give us any information about how fast this big square root approaches 0 as f itself approaches 0. And our Taylor expansions are all centered in f equals 0, so we need some information about what happens in that range. But there's another problem to be aware of. You see, the variable f at the denominator is a problem, as our approximations rely on the limit as f approaches 0. This problem is partially solved by the first terms of the Taylor expansions, which overcome the f at the denominator. But what happens with this first f here at the denominator? Pay attention to what follows. 
like the maximum roughness RT, we suppose this big formula for the average roughness RA will end up being something proportional to F squared. The related Schmalz formula is a big hint in this direction, of course. This means that we must come up with all the possible terms up to f cubed, from this partial expression here, as we will have to divide them by f, and thus, in the end, we will be left with all the possible terms proportional to f squared, as we wanted. So, coming back to the previous step, we are not free to choose the number of terms we have to keep for our calculation. We will need all of them. Good news is we won't need additional ones, but these here will suffice. Okay then, let's go ahead with the calculations. Here we just carry out some basic multiplications. Here we add what can be added. Here we expand the square. Here we just switch signs because of the minus sign before the parenthesis. Those two r squared cancel out. And now? Now it seems like we cannot go any further. How do we end up with a polynomial form for this expression? In the end it's easy. As a reiterating process, let's find out the Taylor expansion for that final square root. And this is what we get. Feel free to give it a try and come up with the same result. So, our big square root can be approximated by this polynomial here. Let's put that polynomial inside our formula. You see, things look a bit simpler and cleaner now. What about this other expression here? We just have to carry out some easy multiplications but, in order to save some time, let's take a look at our previous calculation. We've already got that result. Let's use it. Here we are. We're almost there. Here is the expression we're left with. Let's start by dividing that expression in green by R. Let's then carry out those multiplications. Please note that this specific product was omitted. It would give us a term proportional to F to the fifth power and, when divided by the initial F at the denominator, we will get a term proportional to F to the fourth power. But, as we said, we only need final terms up to the second power. Okay then, what about that arcsine function? Please remember the Taylor expansion of the arcsine function here. It's equal to the argument of the arcsine function as it is, plus the same argument cubed over 6. So, let's take the argument as it is. It's this term here. Then, what about the cubic term? The argument of the arcsine function here has two terms. One proportional to f, and one proportional to f cubed. When this two-term expression is cubed, the resulting term with the lowest degree will be the cube of the first term. All the other resulting terms, coming from the cube of the second term or combinations between the first and second terms, will be a power of f higher than 3, and they are not needed, as we saw before. So, we just consider the first term cubed, and this is the result. With the next step we carry out the multiplication and simplification of the term in yellow, and we switch signs for the part in blue, because of the minus sign before the parenthesis. Here is what we get. As always, pause the video and take your time to follow all the steps, if you wish. Let's carry out the multiplication by r squared for that part in yellow. Let's add what we can add together, and we're left with this. Let's first multiply by 2. Let's now divide by f. We're left with two terms, both proportional to f squared, as we wanted. Let's find the sum of these two, by finding the least common multiple of the denominators. And here is our final result. The square root of 3, divided by 54 times r, times f squared. We made it finally. This is the best second degree approximation of the original exact and complicated formula for the average roughness RA. I don't know about you, but it feels very rewarding for me. The square root of 3 divided by 54 is approximately 0.032075. Let's compare this result with the Schmalz formula. 1 over 32 is exactly 0.03125. Because of that, we see that the second version of that formula is the more accurate one. So, if you ever need to use the Schmalz formula for the average roughness RA, use these ones. Do not use these ones. Someone who didn't know about the math behind this formula probably messed things up. In any case, how do these three approximations compare? How well do they approximate the exact formula? Here is a graph showing it all. Again, we considered a value of 0.4 for the radius r of the cutting insert, which is a pretty common value. You can see that the three approximations pretty much overlap. Remember that, due to the geometric construction of the problem, the feed rate f must be smaller than two times the radius r. And in practice, the feed rate f is much smaller than the radius r. A typical value for the feed rate f is 0.05 mm per revolution, which sits right here on the f axis. This is why the divergence of the approximations from the real value doesn't matter much, since the divergence occurs for greater values of the feed rate f, which are not of any practical use. 
By the way, this is why we chose f equals 0 for the center of all the Taylor expansions, and not, for example, other values such as f equals r, or something like that. Let's now zoom in, so that the typical value for the feed rate f now sits in the middle. Again, the three approximations are pretty much the same. So, let's zoom in even closer. Please note that we are now considering feed rates f, much smaller than the ones used in practice. Our f axis now goes up to 0.003, whereas a typical value for the feed rate f would be 0.05 millimeters per revolution, that is. And, again, despite approaching zero beyond any practical use, the three approximations are still very close. So, instead of the functions themselves, let's now consider the deviations of those formulae, from the real value. And now it's pretty clear that our formula is the best approximation, the real good one. Let's just appreciate this. Okay then, we can conclude that none of these three formulae is a bad approximation. However, it makes no sense to use a messed up approximation, like this version of the Schmalz formula. Well, we're at the end of the video. Our aim was to answer our initial questions. Where do Schmalz formulae come from? Now we know. Which one for the average roughness is correct and why? We got it. But we also found out the real exact formula and the real exact coefficient for the best approximation. Square root of 3, over 54. And, who's Mr. Schmalz? Well, that's just a joke. I don't know who he is and how the hell he originally came up with those formulae. I guess they're just some numerical approximation, or maybe they've been obtained with a simpler process than the one explained in this video of mine. And with, simpler, I mean of course, smarter. Let me know if you can find any source material which explains the Schmalz formula and their original derivation. I couldn't, and I came up with this video to give myself a proof for those formulae. I hope you appreciated the effort and enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.